We are about to step on board the longest non-stop flight in the world. This is Singapore Airlines' flagship route from New York to Singapore, covering a distance of almost 10,000 miles in just under 19 hours. I'm Nonstop Dan. I've been reviewing flights full-time on YouTube for the past seven years and have tried 150 different airlines in the process. All my flights are self-funded using airline miles or sometimes cash if there's a good deal, so I can be honest about my experiences. Today, I was leaving my dad and his side of the family in New York and heading all the way around the world. Why? Because there was an unmissable deal to take the world's longest flight in business class and tick off this avgeek bucket list experience. The trip started at the Intercontinental The Barclay in New York, where I stayed to celebrate the launch of IHG One Rewards. With IHG One Rewards, it's easier than ever to earn status. Starting at just 10 nights a year, you'll earn Silver Elite status, which gets you a bunch of perks, including accelerated points earnings to use for your free nights. At 20 nights, you're already Gold Elite, which makes you eligible for my new favorite feature of IHG One Rewards, the Milestone Rewards. This makes staying at IHG Hotel and resorts more rewarding than ever and lets members choose what they value. After your 20th, for every 10 nights you stay, you get to choose a new reward between confirmable suite upgrades, an FMB credit, extra points, or even an annual lounge pass. In addition to this, all members now enjoy late checkout, even club members. That means all you have to do is sign up for a free account and you'll be eligible for 2 p.m. checkout subject to availability at any of these hotel brands. As a Diamond Elite, I'm also super excited to now be able to enjoy free breakfast in addition to a dedicated diamond support line and award discount opportunities. Learn more about IHG One Rewards and sign up for a free account at the link at the top of the description. Today's flight will take us from Newark Liberty Airport over Canada, Western and Southern Europe, the Middle East, India, and finally Malaysia before touching down in Singapore. The flight leaves on Friday morning New York time and lands on Saturday evening Singapore time, meaning we lose almost two days on the flight. What an adventure. Oscar and I got to Newark Liberty Airport at 8.45 a.m. ahead of our 10.25 a.m. departure. Good morning from Newark Airport. I have been here so many times growing up with a family in New York, but this is my first time flying non-stop to Asia from this airport. And it's not only non-stop to the other side of the world, it is non-stop for 19 hours. That is just so daunting and terrifying in almost any class. I already see a lot of people saying, Dan, this is not the world's longest flight. JFK to Singapore is longer. And now Cathay has a longer flight too. Well, that is technically incorrect for this specific flight. All New York area to Singapore flights are currently taking routes over Europe. And Newark is further from Europe than JFK, obviously, because Jersey is further from everything with class. I'm joking. <laughs> Although the difference is tiny to begin with, this means that generally, the the Newark flight is longer than the JFK flight in practice. The Cathay flight, although scheduled to be longer, actually covers a far shorter distance. So when flying from New York to Singapore, the Newark flight is still the longest on most days, even if it doesn't look like it on paper. This flight is operated by the special A350-900 ULR, standing for ultra long haul. Singapore Airlines is currently the only operator of this aircraft type, and it's in an incredibly unique layout, as you'll see shortly. To give a little spoiler, there's no economy class on board. There are actually only two classes of service, business class and premium economy, so check-in was a breeze. It seemed a lot of people at check-in had connecting flights in Singapore. Talk about a long travel day. After clearing security, we headed to one of two lounges in this pier of Newark Terminal B. The Brits apparently still colonize this part of the US, since the only two lounges in this terminal are from BA or Virgin Atlantic. Singapore Airlines passengers have access to the latter. Virgin is famous for its lounges, but this is not the nicest. The design is all types of wrong, with lacking natural light and a strange layout, so I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but sitting in the terminal seemed preferable. I quickly realized that sitting in this part of New York Terminal B is not preferable. It's not even preferable to sitting and waiting in a middle seat on Ryanair, so I was eager to get on board Dreamy SQ. At 9.55, 30 minutes prior to departure, boarding commenced. When everyone is a premium passenger, there's no priority boarding. Sort of funny when you think about it. 
The Singapore Airlines A350-900 ULR is in such a cool configuration. There are no economy class seats whatsoever and sadly no first class either. Instead, there are 67 business class seats occupying the forward two cabins from door one to door two and door two to door three. The rear business cabin is massive, but as an av geek, I couldn't resist the awesomely unique opportunity to fly in business class but be seated behind the wing. That's why I assigned seat 29. 9K for myself and 28K for Oscar, offering us great views outside and quite a lot of privacy, although there was some traffic to the lavatories now and then. The forward cabin is most private and quiet. In premium economy, there are 94 seats in a 232 layout, with the rear rows being ideal if you're traveling alone. Sadly, SQ now charges extra for these, but they will likely be worth it for the added privacy. At the door, we were greeted by an army of Singapore Airlines crew who welcomed us on board. I turned right from door two into the rear business class cabin. This is definitely one of the largest business class cabins in the world besides on an A380, and it felt wonderfully airy thanks to the center section not having overhead lockers. I almost walked all the way to Singapore just to get to my seat, but there it was, 29K. I seem to be in a fringe minority who loves Singapore Airlines business class seat. I guess I'm just quirky like that, but I've always loved it and continue to do so. First of all, the seat is wide. In fact, it's wider than many first class seats. There's also plentiful storage with a closable compartment by the window, the side section, and an open drawer behind you. Here, you'll find your charging ports as well as a reading light and headphone jack. There's also a mirror if you wanna see how awful you look after a 19 hour flight. Your seat controls are on the opposite armrest allowing you to control lights and your seat recline although the seat doesn't recline into a bed. Instead, in a rather unique setup, the seat flips over to become a bed. You wanna hear something really bizarre though? I'm not sure if it's always been this way since I don't remember reacting to it earlier, but the massive entertainment screen, which is actually very close to your face, is not touchscreen. Instead, you have to use the small and sometimes unresponsive remote to control the system. It's a bummer the remote doesn't work separately so you can watch the in-flight map on it while watching a show on the big screen. Still, the entertainment system is so good you could fly back and forth between Newark and Singapore every single day and never run out of content. Thousands of options from all over the world. To watch stuff, you'll want headphones, and Singapore Airlines provides an excellent pair of those for use on the flight. As I was settling in, two wonderful crew members came by to welcome me on board by name. I imagine I annoyed the flight attendant immediately, but I had to ask about her name. Sure enough, the name on her badge was correct, a name she shared with a former British Prime Minister. No, it wasn't David Cameron, it wasn't Tony Blair. I was being served Singapore slings by none other than Theresa May. Welcome aboard Singapore Airlines. As the safety equipment on this aircraft may differ from that on other aircraft, please give us your attention as we bring you through this important safety briefing and on a journey through Singapore. Soon enough, the iconic safety video started to play and we were pushing back. Due to COVID, there's no pre-departure service whatsoever on Singapore Airlines, which is a shame. It was a busy day at Newark and loads of planes were in line for takeoff. We got to the very end of the runway and still ended up using almost all of it because we were so heavy despite only having 90 passengers on board. Wow. A quick congrats to these three recent subscribers who just won free consultations with me to maximize how many airline points they earn or help with redemptions. If you're subscribed to my channel, you can win all types of cool prizes in every video. You wanna know what makes Singapore Airlines unique? They don't offer amenity kits like most other airlines since most things are available only on demand. They leave some slippers and socks by your seat and everything else you could possibly want is available either by asking the crew or in the lavatory. 
There are quite a few lavatories to choose from with such a large business class cabin and they were all generally quite tight. They do feature some nice amenities though and were kept spotless throughout the flight. While there, I changed into my Singapore Airlines first class pajamas from my previous video to get extra comfy. I'm honestly surprised they don't offer pajamas on such a long flight in business class so it's a BYOP situation. Since we're on the topic of amenities, I want to show you this kit. I didn't know there was one, but the crew randomly came by offering one about 4 hours into the flight. It contained miniature versions of the lavatory amenities and a lip balm. Just 3 items, but a nice bag for sure. About an hour and a half after takeoff, Theresa May came by to serve me lunch. The tray table popped up out of the side and was moderately adjustable, although it was difficult to get out of the seat while the table was down. There are no menus on board and for that matter, no instructions on how the dining would work. However, the Singapore Airlines app does show the dining options and as you can see, there was a set lunch and then vaguely defined mid-flight onwards and refreshment meals. I didn't know what that meant, but I assumed it meant the second meals were dine on demand. Demand. It turns out the second meal was scheduled for the 8 hour point. The drink selection is incredibly extensive and oh so impressive. You can also usually book the cook, which means choosing an option beforehand, but that's currently unavailable from Newark. I went for a Singapore sling after takeoff which was served with some packaged nuts. No hot towels in sight sadly. Then the tray with the appetizer came out. While the presentation was decent, the catering Singapore Airlines has out of Newark is almost as low quality as Newark Terminal B. I really want to get in touch with the people who make this uncreative, flavorless disappointment. I mean, this is the main course. I guess Protein was denied its visa to Singapore and couldn't make the flight. I know some of you will say it's just because I ordered a special meal, but catering is consistently bad out of most US airports and it's telling what quality of ingredients these caterers and in turn airlines are choosing if they won't even invest in tofu or the abundance of mock meat brands available nowadays. The chicken or steak they're serving is probably so cheap you wouldn't even consider buying it at your local supermarket. The dessert was canned fruit. <laughs> Yikes. The bigger problem was the meal planning. A lot of people went to sleep immediately after takeoff from Newark, presumably so they'd adjust to the time difference with Singapore being 12 hours ahead. These people missed the main meal and had no option to eat it later. Likewise, even more people were sleeping during the meal at the 8 hour point. It would make so much more sense, in my opinion, if they combined all the menus into one dine on demand menu, offering light options, mains, and desserts that can be eaten at any time, allowing people to pick and mix what suits them and their body clock. Well, after lunch I had work to do, so I connected to the in-flight Wi-Fi. Business class passengers get 100 megabytes of free data which will last you about a minute on Instagram or Twitter. Luckily you can buy more and I was so happy to see that Singapore Airlines now offers an unlimited data plan. Sneakily they don't say that it's unlimited, but rather they just don't state a limit. You can get 3 hours for $16 which isn't too bad, especially since speeds were decent. Since we were flying east, our day was pretty short so I asked for turn down service to get some shots of the bed in daylight. Controversial opinion alert! Just like I'm a fan of the Singapore Airlines business class seat, I'm a massive fan of the bed. Sure, you have to sleep diagonally, but most of the bed, besides the foot area, is just so wide. The bedding is excellent, and even without individual air vents, I didn't end up having any problems getting comfortable here. I think this is the type of seat you just have to try for yourself because it seems people either love it or hate it. At this point, we were cruising over the Atlantic outside Ireland and the sun gradually started to set. Even with 90 passengers on board, business class was relatively full. You would never know though since the seats are extremely private. Even if seated in the middle, it's difficult to see or speak to your travel companion. Personally, I love how high the seat backs are because even without a door, you feel like you have your own little cocoon and it's just so luxurious. Back to the topic of food. As someone who lives to eat, I was worried the food wouldn't be good and on a 19 hour flight, you need backups. The whole flight I'd been snacking on all types of delicious junk from Trader Joe's, I wasn't nearly full from my first meal so I eventually ordered the rice noodle soup from the menu. There's something so comforting about eating soup on planes even though I know the water is not the most sanitary. I can't say it was delicious but it did the job and the presentation was lovely. 
Around mid-flight, this meal was served, starting with a summer roll. It was followed by this dish that was awfully reminiscent of the previous meal, but in a different form. Sadly, not exactly a good second meal either. We finish it off with more canned fruit. I should mention that, in my experience, catering is always much better out of Singapore. So this is likely more of a Newark problem, just like the food was from Frankfurt in my previous video. Are we starting to see a pattern? I wasn't sure how many hours of darkness we'd have given that we were landing in Singapore in the late afternoon, but I figured I had to stop working at some point, so it was finally time for some sleep. I decided to set the alarm on my watch for 4 hours later to ensure I was tired when we landed in Singapore. I guess I slept about 2.5 of those 4 hours. I don't know how the other people did it, but my sleep schedule turned out to be a terrible idea. I had the worst jet lag of my life for a good week after landing in Singapore. Before landing, we got to enjoy this indulgent sandwich. I mean, just look at it. This is business class dining at its best. And since I wasn't full, I indulged in some ramen noodles, which were decent at least. Now, throughout the flight, the lovely crew came by with a snack basket about once an hour containing a mix of Singaporean and American snacks. As always on Singapore Airlines, the crew was fantastic. And I have to give a special shout out to Ben Yapa from Thailand who was just lovely. Everyone was so friendly and brought that relaxed and fun yet professional vibe that I've never really found on any other airline. When passing me in the aisle, they'd say, excuse me, Mr. Goz. I mean, how do they memorize everyone's name? Talk about a difference from being nudged to the side on Lufthansa. And these airlines are partners? Before I knew it, we were approaching Singapore. Weirdly, this flight went by so fast. I could have easily stayed on board for longer despite the poor food, so the flight time didn't end up being a problem for me. I think it was the combo of having Wi-Fi and being able to stay connected like on the ground, paired with the service and privacy that made this feel just like a pleasant office in the sky. We touched down 5 minutes out of schedule at Changi and taxied to our gate where I was already about to pass out. It's hard to believe we actually landed after 18 hours and 10 minutes. Before we could get to bed at the Intercontinental Singapore, we headed to one of our fave spots in the city, Fortune Center. Basically a massive vegan mall for some real food. Being so tired, it took a while to transition into speaking Singlish, which is always more efficient in Singapore lah. Jet lag, is it? So would I take this flight again? Personally, no, not if I had a choice. Not because the flight was bad, it was actually pretty great besides the food and the whole setup of the meal service. But the jet lag is really what gets me. This is a journey that requires a stopover in my opinion, or at least careful planning to start adjusting your body clock beforehand. If you need the convenience of a non-stop though, this non-stop is non-stop to hen approved. How much did I pay for this flight? I told you there was an excellent deal, and it truly was. We paid just 68,000 miles one way and $5 in taxes from Newark to Singapore in business class last month when Singapore Airlines was doing an award sale. This is definitely among my best redemptions ever, and it's a perfect example of why it's so valuable to have a good stash of credit card points that let you transfer to different airlines when these deals come around, giving you so much flexibility. I transferred American Express points and that's what I recommend because it's instant. My US viewers can currently earn an incredible sign up bonus of 60,000 points on the American Express gold card and I really appreciate if you use my link below. Heads up for my Swedish viewers as well that for the next two weeks only, you can earn double the normal sign up bonus on most American Express cards in Sweden. I've left the links below. While this business class promo price is no longer available, there is currently an offer for around 50,000 miles one way and premium economy which is a sweet deal too and definitely worth checking out. With that, see you next time my friends. Until then, fly safe.